The one thing that everyone said mm -hmm. is that when he gets one on the whiskers, yeah. he's going to go the same way as he's gone previously. I think I the atmosphere, atmosphere was better. I think the atmosphere was great. The roof came off when Anthony Joshua knocked out Francis Ngannou. Yeah. He wins a rematch, by the way, by KO. How sad would it be, by the way, if Jake Paul knocked out Mike Tyson? You've not got one undisputed t t yeah. fight. You've got two Absolutely. against two different protagonists. Welcome to episode 64 of Talk Boxing with Simon Jordan and Spencer Oliver. Spencer, what the hell's going on? What are you, <laughs> the Poland Lick gang now? And an iPad as well, well you can't read. Yeah, absolutely, I don't know, they put pictures on here, is that? Yeah, I don't yeah. know what that's about. It's not a colouring yeah, in book. I, do you know what, Simon, I thought, you're getting all these comments about smart clobber and all that. Spencer, you know, do you like the boots, if you're going to wear a Poland well, Lick, the you, boots? No. If you're oh. going to wear a polo neck or smart okay. clothes, you need not to look like Tutu out of Fantasy Island, going, the plane, the plane. <laughs> right? Let's have it right. Nice to see you. All right. Let's uh, do it. I watched a little bit of your um, um, uh, watch, watch, along. watch Along yep. with Troy Dini, who I like a lot, yeah. and um, Josh Warrington mm -hmm. and Adam. But the Watch Along was, of course, Ingarnu versus Anthony Joshua. Yeah. Some punch. <sighs> oh, mate. Some like, punch. You know, if you look down. You know, if you go through the history of heavyweight boxing, that, that ranks up there as one of the best knockouts. I mean, that was an unbelievable punch. He set it up well. First round, you could see the writing was on the wall. I mean, look, mm. Simon, going into this one, we didn't know really where it was at. You can only go off the performance with Ngannou against Tyson Fury, and we know... If we you know, want to, I yeah, didn't no, want to. No, no, but I, I, I did, because I looked at it and went, yes, Tyson Fury had a really bad day at the office, but you looked at Ngannou and go, actually, this guy can fight a little bit. He's heavy-handed. He's stylistically potentially dangerous for Joshua. But what I'm saying is Joshua, Ben Davidson, great, you know, they've done their homework, great tactics going in there. Joshua set it up, set the trap in the first round, that right hand through the middle, and you can see it. And then Garnu done the stupid thing of switching the southpaw, southpaw, which, which opens straight right. Uh, 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 opens the shot up anyway. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the, the knockdown again in the second round, the finish, that, that shot again, he just sort of yeah. touched right hand through the middle and um, yeah, swung from the hip, knockout. Didn't Brilliant knockout. That to me. Made a statement, right? That was one of the best knockouts I've seen since. Um, Lennox Lewis knocked out Hazim Rackman nice. in the return after he'd lost the first fight to Rackman. Yeah. And I went to that fight and that was a that was a good a punch as that. I spent last week arguing with you and arguing with Don Childs to some extent, um, a Daniel Dubois trainer, and other boxing voices about this ridiculous assertion that Francis Ngannou and MMA should be making a dent in the heavyweight division. Mm. And I started to question the validity yeah. of how good these elite heavyweights were. Because if you're an elite heavyweight, there's no parallel universe yeah. where an MMA fighter should come in and create the kind of problems that Francis Ngannou has created. So when I saw Anthony Joshua on Friday, I had two Hail Marys. One Hail Mary for Joseph Parker, probably saving the rest of the heavyweight division having to fight Zili Zhang. Yeah, yeah. Right? And the other Hail Mary, which is a bigger one, Anthony Joshua, for me, re-established the credibility of heavyweight boxing Agree. by knocking out Francis Ngannou, doing what should have been done mm -hmm. by Fury in the first fight, and stopping a lot of the nonsense that you were parroting as well, mm -hmm. that somehow Francis Ngannou was going to make a statement or was a jeopardy fight for Anthony Joshua, because Anthony Joshua, doing what a heavyweight champion that he once was and mm -hmm. may well be again, should be doing, which is dispatching Francis Ngannou. I'm so pleased that Anthony Joshua had done that, you know, and he, and he made that statement and put this to bed, you know, with this crossover thing. But you're right in what you say. There was jeopardy there. I thought that, you know, you're only going off the Ngannou performance against Fury. And I'm thinking this guy can fight. And if Joshua sits in the pocket, gets too greedy, you know, he could get caught. And that was my concern and that was my worry. But Joshua went out there and, and he systematically took him apart. And I think it was a, yeah, I think it was a performance that was needed for boxing, by the way. It Do you really think was. Ngannou, I mean, I think the conventional wisdom thought that what was going to happen was that Joshua was going to be cautious for the first four or five rounds, yes. take him into deep waters, and then get rid of him in the later parts of the fight. Do you think that Ngannou got drunk on the belief that somehow everyone, I was listening to Dan Hardy, the MMA yeah. fighter, and other people suggesting that because of his performance against Tyson Fury, that this was a real fight that he could win, so he yeah. comes in with a different mentality than the one he went into against Tyson Fury, and then so subsequently made it potentially easier for Anthony Joshua to execute an outcome Absolutely. because Ngannou was in a different mindset, totally. a different space. Absolutely, you know, your so-called boxing experts. There was, a, there was a split, there was a divide. Actually, there was probably, I don't know, what it was, 
split on in, um, in Anthony Joshua's favour. I think a lot of people, expect, you know, not just a not just the public perception, but a lot of boxing experts as well felt that Ngannou was gonna was gonna do the job. So yeah, I mean, you know, he probably did get drunk on his own beliefs. You know, that, that like listening to what was going on around him because he went in there. And he found out what a real boxer was all about, you know. Mm. And Anthony Joshua demonstrated that. He went in there, he, he, you know, he didn't get too greedy. He took his time, he waited, he looked for the shot and executed the perfect game plan. But, I, yeah, I think that Francis but, and Gardner would, have, in the would face have got a lot of confidence off, off the Tyson Fury performance, without a doubt. But it flies in the face of what everyone said, though, including you. Yeah. Because the first time Anthony Joshua pinged him... I didn't he, say that Anthony Joshua was going to lose. I didn't say... No, yeah. I didn't know. And that's not such, you didn't say that. No. But everybody, I'd never thought for one second, and I'm not rewriting history. Yeah. I never thought that, that Ngannou should cause Anthony Joshua any problems. The, only, the only thing that, could, that Anthony Joshua should be frightened of was mm. fear itself, which is actually, if I do lose this fella, I'm done. Yeah. But really and truly, if Anthony Joshua was the heavyweight that we think he is, then th there's no surprise that he's dispatched of this fella. Mm -hmm. And he, he hit him, the first time Anthony lands a meaningful punch on him, he knocks him down. Absolutely. And all this about yeah. how resolute he is and all this about what he's done in the past goes back to the position of not having fought for 18 months, yeah. having a knee rebuild and being his first fight. So this idea, what happens is everyone suddenly reacts instantaneously. Well, we all got drawn in. And, mm. and to be fair, you're right. You called it a mismatch from the off. Yeah. You, you know, and you, and you highlighted the injuries that he'd been through and et cetera, et cetera. Take the Fury performance out of it. You said it's a mismatch and it's a fight with a guy that's going in against a former Olympic champion and two-time world heavyweight champion. Admit, yeah, you got that one right. And we all got drawn in and suckered in off the performance that he put in against Tyson Fury. But I suppose it now opens up that debate on where Tyson Fury's at in his career. Well, that's going to be my next question. And because how bad... Do you, let, me, let me repackage it. I'm going to say how bad must have Fury's performance been. But is it, was it a matter of timing? Do you think that potentially it could have been a different outcome if Joshua had fought in Garnu first? and ultimately walked into a situation where Ngannou's going into the fight with a different mentality, not thinking the, the things that he might have been thinking in this fight, because mm -hmm. he thought that stylistically Anthony Joshua was perfect for him. Yeah. No, I, 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 I truly believe that it was Anthony Joshua approaching the fight professionally and doing what he had to do and treating it as a real fight. And I think that Tyson Fury made that mistake of not taking the fight seriously. Even though, even though he... a different mindset. Even though he absolutely religiously denies that. Yeah, he says, I don't believe that. No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. that. Yeah. You know, because the, we know how good Tyson Fury is, right? And he is, he is up there and possibly the best of our modern era, right? And so you look at that performance and you saw the way that Fury boxed in that fight. You go, I don't care if he said that he actually did approach the fight right and he did put in all the training. He's going to say that in the aftermath because you can't, you, you know, you can't go into fights like, with no fear factor and not taking the fight seriously. You have to show your opponent respect. Mm. And he fell into that trap and paid the price for that Tyson Fury. We won't see that Fury on May the 18th no, against Alexander we'll. Usyk. I don't think we will. Do you think, I mean, a lot's been made. I mean, and I thought, by the way, I thought Anthony Joshua handled the media brilliantly yeah. on Friday. I love the way he turned, I think it was to the Sky Guys, and turned around and said, and you lot. Right? <laughs> and I thought, well done to you. And I thought yeah. also, I thought he was going to disappear into some rambling rubbish. And he didn't. He held it together and was very articulate, very eloquent. And I thought to myself, yeah, you look again like the poster boy of heavyweight boxing again. Absolutely. For lots of reasons, not just from the performance, yeah. but the way he conducted himself. But we've now got this idea, and I just want to explore it with you quickly, that Anthony Joshua, over the last 11 months, he's had four fights. You always yeah. talk about activity being a key component, right? Yeah, yeah, so he's yeah. been active, right? He's had four fights. Franklin, Hellenius, Otto Wallin, and Ngannou. Yeah. Do you think now, as is being the picture being painted by others, I read, I read an article by yeah. Jeff Powell talking about the re-emergence of Anthony Joshua. I and thought you say you read an article from Gareth Davison. No, I wouldn't read that. I'd wipe my backside <laughs> on it. Um, um, the, 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 the idea that we've now got the best version of Anthony Joshua, do you subscribe to that? Absolutely. You? you do? Absolutely. I, I, Simon, I said this before, going back to the Franklin fight, I said to you, activity was key for Joshua. That's affected his confidence in his own ability, and I know this for a fact. Right. And I think that activity was key. The more active he was, the better he'll perform, because it's not just about the physicality side of it, it's about the mental state of it, psychological, stuff, psychological yeah. side as well. And I think that that's what we're seeing now. Joshua wants to fight again in June or July. Yeah. They're talking about Philip Hergovic, possibly. Get in there. Win a world Philip Hergovic, yeah. I think you called that fight as well. 
I think if the undisputed fight happens, if we if, if we get that fight, then the titles become the titles start to get freed up. Joshua Philip Hergovic is a fight that I, is, that will possibly happen in yeah. June or July. So and then he's got his know, third world title Josh because reckons, I think he'll beat Hergovic. Absolutely. Josh reckons that this activity, you're seeing him with better performances all the time. And Can then, I frame it differently for yeah. the purpose of debate? Yeah. We're talking about the best version of Anthony Joshua, right? And the questions that have abounded have been twofold. We've discussed it and other people have discussed it. Lots of yeah. people have said the pilot light's gone out. He doesn't have the propensity to put himself in, in, in harm's way in order to deliver outcomes, like he sure. did against Klitschko and like he had to do against Andy Ruiz and obviously lost, right? Sure. So we've seen him fight Franklin, who didn't really come to fight. We've seen him fight Robert Hellenius, who didn't really come to fight mm -hmm. and was avoiding him until he caught up with him. Yeah. Otto Walling couldn't, yeah. and neither could Francis Ngannou. When we talk about the best version of Anthony Joshua, right. Right, he's had, in these four fights, no risk. If the risk going into the ring is always there. I get that. Yep. But no one's thrown back at him really of any significance. When he fights one of the top guys, he's going to get hit. Right. Let me explain. Let so me explain. is he in a better position now to be able to cope with that issue? Because the one thing that everyone said mm -hmm. is that when he gets one on the whiskers, yep. he's going to go the same way as he's gone previously. Yeah. No, I totally don't agree with that. So let me okay. explain. Going back to the front... Um, Jermaine Franklin fight. Yep. So you said Franklin come and he didn't really engage. Well, guess what? Joshua didn't either. Joshua was throwing his Agreed. shots and holding his feet Agreed. because he didn't have that confidence, right? Inactivity was playing a big part of that. Then we fast forward into his ne next fight. Hellenius, Robert Hellenius. Who avoided him. Yeah, yeah. But Joshua, also, when you if you, look, if you look back on that fight, for the first six rounds, you're going, round two comes, you're going, come on, Josh, start stepping in now. He was throwing his, he was throwing his shots but holding his feet still. Again, still not really having that confidence. The first people time he stepped that to in, what Wilder did to Hellenius, yeah. but Hellenius came to fight Wilder, didn't uh, he? Yeah, 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 he came to yeah. fight Wilder, but it also Wilder sort of rolled the dice and Wilder was yeah. like that anyway. Joshua was holding his feet, he was throwing the shots, leaning back even off the shots. Seventh round, first time he'd done it, stepped in, boom, knocked him out. Then we see that, so you're going, right, now against Otto Wallin, who's a tricky southpaw, awkward southpaw. So Joshua has to fight, close the space. He has to, you know, he has to control that space. And he'd done that against Wallin. And that's why he made it as easy as, as he did. Because, you know, he was stepping in, he was believing himself, going phase one, then going again. You know, they're putting the shots together, combinations. So you're watching the progression every time in the, in, in the performances. That's what I'm saying. That's why I said to you, uh, Anthony Joshua at his best, He's like now, it's like the old Anthony Joshua, but what's he got different from the old Anthony Joshua to now? He's got experience. And so if you had the old Anthony Joshua fighting with his heart on his sleeve, but he's got experience, he mm. now knows when to, when to go for it, when not to go for it. I think he paid that price against... So you don't think there's any questions? I'm, not, I'm just playing devil's yeah. advocate. Yeah. Because we saw Anthony get straightened by Dillian White. Yeah. Right? We saw him have challenges against Andy Ruiz, and I'm being told repeatedly there's lots more behind the scenes of that Andy Ruiz fight that when people yeah. actually get to understand it, will understand why he lost that sure. fight. We saw him have a mental meltdown at the end of the Usyk fight. Yeah. You now believe that he's prepared, when it comes on top to the top guys, to go to the same place that he went to with Klitschko, Absolutely. To win a world title again. Absolutely. You won't have to do it against Hogovic. I think you'll no. beat Hogovic. No. I, 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 no. But when he gets in against Fury, or yeah. maybe Usyk again. Absolutely. I think that if the third fight against Usyk happens right now, and Anthony Joshua, this Anthony Joshua, he beats Usyk. This uh, Anthony Joshua versus Tyson Fury, that's a great and fight. You, and, you, and you believe that's that? That's a 50-50 because, fight. Because you now, irrespective of the opposition, and he's done his job, and each one of these fights has built a platform for Anthony now to build, to build the psychological well-being back into his fighting. How much of that do you attribute to Ben Davison, by the way? A lot, because... It is a team effort, so like for a fighter... there's a loving going now, no, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, no, I mean, no, no, for a fighter, a fighter's got to have like that confidence, like, that, that confidence where, you know what I mean, where your trainer says something, he says to you, jump, you, you ask how high. It's like one of those ones that it's like, you've got to believe in what your trainer's sending you. And I think that Ben Davison is a great student at the game and he works out tactically, gets it right. And I think that Joshua has that belief in his trainer, like... A, com a happy fight is a very dangerous one, and he's happy Which is what you said last in his week. surroundings. Yeah. He's happy in his surroundings. The whole team, it seems like everything's right for him, and we're seeing that in his performances. Like I say to you, Joshua, now you can put him in, you know, a talk of him and Tyson Fury 12 months ago, Simon, you go, that's not even a conversation. You're going to go, it's probably 90, no. 90 10. It wasn't ready in favor for it. Of, uh, in But he wouldn't have been ready for it off the back of two defeats at Usyk, was he? It's and, a 50 50 and, fight yeah, now. And now it's more of a compelling fight. Yeah. And I, I think that's it's an interesting one because I think the public will start demanding that fight. And it'll be interesting, just as an offshoot, before I get to something you said on Friday about Anthony Joshua, which I just want to question you on. 
they're, 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 I think the media will start building up, the Western media will start building up the narrative, we need to see Fury versus Joshua. Yeah. And I just wonder if there's a left field play of, of the Saudis going to Usyk and saying, do you want to take step aside money? For the second fight. For Joshua versus Fury. What, instead of the May the 18th? Mm. No, see, I think the undisputed happens, but I don't think the, re I, the I rematch agree. does. Yeah, because I had this discussion with someone else and saying, have the Saudis, because the Saudis will listen to, the, the, to some extent, their own agenda, of course, yeah. and if the Western media start talking about Fury Joshua, could there be a step aside for, for, mm. for, for, for Usyk? If I'm Usyk, why would I do that? Um, but Fury will know, because I think Usyk's about the belts, and I think Fury's about the reputation and the money. Right. And there's a bigger fight. Yeah. There's more interested in Fury versus Joshua now than there is against Fury against Usyk. The only thing that hangs that more on the Fury Usyk fight is because it's undisputed, and we haven't Absolutely. seen one for 25 years. What I think you're right on is that the rematch, if Fury beats Usyk, yeah. I think you could get Usyk to step aside on the rematch yeah. for Fury versus Joshua. So this is where I see it. I think that Fury Fury Usyk goes May the 18th. Yeah. Anti Joshua fights Hergovic in June. I, no, I don't think he does. Because Her it, it, Anthony Joshua will fight Hergovic for the vacant IBF belt. Yeah, which will be dropped after yeah, the fight. I, d I don't know if it will be dropped because I don't think the re it's only going to be dropped because of the rematch clause that's in place. So they have to drop it because to give the yeah. mandatory. You think they can't engineer that? So, yeah, no, no, what I'm They'll saying is it. this is how I see it. I think that Fury Usyk goes May the 18th. Anthony Joshua possibly fights Joseph Parker too in between that. And then we get Joshua versus Fury. That's where I say, I'm not sure where Hergovic fits into it. But if you, unless the IBF belt's on the line. Here's a, here's a thought process for you. If the IBF belt drops off, off as a result of mandatories. Then we get Joshua. Her Hergovic, Hergovic is the mandatory. Yeah, right? Joshua's Joshua gets the IBF. Fury beats Usyk yeah. and keeps the WBC, the WBO and the WBA yeah. belts. You've not got one undisputed t t yeah. fight. You've got two Absolutely. against two different protagonists. Yeah. Then you're talking about serious history being made, not only just in boxing terms, but Saudi are engineering and undisputed for the first time in 25 years since, yeah. since Holyfield um, versus Lewis. Yeah. If Fury wins that fight, you engineer another undisputed yeah. because ultimately because he picks up the picks up Joshua, unless of course yeah. WBO and WA start like mandatory and can strip it away. But I think that Anthony Joshua has now put himself, what a year, what a change in circumstances from somebody that's a busted flush with the pilot light gone out, and you've mm -hmm. been consistent, you don't think that's the case to somebody now that potentially has changed the, because of the diminishing of the heavyweight division by the yeah. Francis Ngannou's performance against Tyson Fury and the fight that's been made, mm -hmm. Anthony Joshua has now put himself in a position for, actually via Fury yeah. to be ultimately the potential game changer again Absolutely. for heavyweight boxing. Absolutely. You know how the landscape okay. changes Fair with heavyweight him. boxing is unbelievable. I, mean, I still think he's got a question to ask about when he gets yeah. one on the whiskers. We will see. You, make, you made a statement on Saturday night, and it probably was in a moment of great euphoria uh, for your mate, but you said Anthony Joshua is the greatest heavyweight of his era. Yeah. Now you, potentially, did I say no, potentially? No, you just... Uh, Are you I, sure? Did you miss that word out? Do you want no, to rewind I, that? No, I think that's probably got two syllables <laughs> and isn't the word that didn't, you would use. Right? Didn't, no, I, I said, what I said was, in this time... Who, for you, at the moment, is the leader of the pack? Is there a leader of the pack? If there isn't, who's the closest to becoming no, no, the leader of the pack? There was a clear leader of the pack in Tyson Fury. He got the last performance. He looked terrible in his last performance. Don't know about the preparation, whether the wheels are coming off. We're going to find out a little bit more about that on May the 18th. You see Anthony Joshua. You see the momentum. You see the improvements. I'm going AJ, mate. Anthony Joshua will become... The greatest fight, I think, heavyweight fighter of this era. If you said will, I then did. okay, I'll let you get away with it. I did. If you didn't say that, I did then say you will. need to be taken out of the back and given a few smacks. <laughs> because on one hand, you're saying say, that Tyson Fury is will. a generational <laughs> great. So make your mind up. Did you pick up on me saying as well, what was we talking about when I said, oh, when I, I, I said Mike Tyson was beaten by Peter McNeely, but he wasn't, it was Kevin McBride. It wasn't. So I want to correct myself with that mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Very rare mistake by myself yeah. there. <laughs> OK. I saw an article written in the paper recently about Kevin McBride and his propensity to, to look at the Tyson fight, because obviously he was the last fight that Tyson had before he retired. Yeah. Obviously, we've got this freak show coming mm. up with Jake Paul. But let's not get into that for yeah. a second. Right. About so a Hail Mary I'm going to give for uh, Anthony Joshua's performance, for the way he interacted with the media, and for with stopping this ridiculous spectacle of MMA mm -hmm. fighters getting a bit carried away with what they can and can't do. Let's move on to 
just quickly before you do that, where do you where do you rank Joshua in right now in the current crop of heavyweights? Well, where I would he sit? Well, so I mean, we, we, you got to remember he went down the rankings. We had him well, in the four with or due five. Respect, with, with due respect, yeah, it depends what you what you're ranking against. If you're saying Joseph Parker has just beaten Deontay Wilder. And Julie Zhang. Yeah, brilliant. <coughs> You've got to say Joseph Parker at the moment at the top yeah. of the pole. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just curious to say, wait, see where you think he sits. I think he sits in a very significant conversation because not only does he sit there because he's a two-time heavyweight champion of the world, not only does he sit there because he's box off his gold mm. and makes everybody a load of money, he sits there because he's vanquished Ngannou, he's won four mm. fights in a row, and everybody wants to see Anthony no, Joshua I'm talking, about, I'm talking about where you think he ranks. Forget what's gone on outside that, like, as in... No, but not... But not as a boxer. But I'm not like you lot. I don't micromanage it. If you want to look at the fact he's had four who's fighters... The, who's the best heavyweight out there right now? Off the back of where, where we're at? No, that's not a fair analysis because... No, we're not, we, we, I'm just asking Fury fought Ngannou and has fought... And has not fought enough over I'm the last saying, 18 months. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm, not, I'm just asking you who you personally think right now is, is the, best. the best. Well, in, in recent performances, Alexander Usyk. I mean, it's not a difficult question. Well, I've just answered it, but, you're, but I'm qualifying <laughs> it properly rather than for this sort of one-dimensional view that you have. If you're qualifying it on the back of Anthony Joshua's head, right, fourth, so are you going Alexander Usyk? Well, you can't not do because he's beaten Daniel Dubois and he's beaten Absolutely. Anthony Joshua. Yeah, thank you. If you're, okay. looking at, if you're looking at who beat Deontay Wilder and who beat Dillian White, then mm -hmm. you can make an argument for Tyson Fury, then you'd put Francis Ngannou in the mix. Mm -hmm. right? If you look at current form and you say, the man slayed uh, Deontay Wilder and also stopped the fighter that nobody wants to fight, which mm -hmm. is Uli Zhang, then yeah. you'd argue for Joseph Parker. But the three elite heavyweights for me are Joshua, Usyk and Tyson. Parker Zhang. Yes. I didn't think it's an upset. I thought Parker would beat Zhang. To be fair, you did call it, yep. and again, I got it wrong, because I thought Zhang would win, I thought Parker would get too greedy off the back of the Wilder performance. But did Zhang get shown why? up? Did Zhang get shown up? Because ultimately, what we've got is a 41-year-old fighter. Yeah. That besides Hergovic um, and Joe Joyce, mm -hmm. I mean, there's not a lot it's on that list. not bad names there, though. They're not great, though, are they? They're not bad. They're, well, they're, I mean, come okay. on, they're, they're elite heavyweights. Well, like who? Joe, well, Joe Joyce, Joe Joyce and Hergovic. I just Hergovich. said, beside Hergovic and Joyce. Yeah, oh, right. Right. okay, sorry. Right. Besides Turgovic and Joyce, Joyce, there's not a lot on Zhang's record, no. right? But he, he, came to, he, came to, he came to our attention because of the fact that we all thought he won against Turgovic. Yeah. And then, of course, he's demolished Joe Joyce. And Joe Joyce mm -hmm. made the mistake that Francis Ngannou made, mm -hmm. potentially, by believing that it, it doesn't matter if you hit me, I can take whatever punch you want to d d land on me. Sure. And Joe Joyce found out to his, to his misfortune. I'm not surprised with what happened to Zhang. Yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I'm a great admirer of Joseph Parker's now. I, I wasn't an admirer of his previously because I thought that he didn't step in and let his hands go and he's yeah. got bags and bags of ability. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think you can make that argument anymore about him. No. Nah. Um, I think, you know, he got knocked down twice in this fight. But we saw, we saw towards the end of the fight, Zhang yeah. didn't have a lot left, did no, he? No, he gassed. He gassed. Yeah. Really from the middle of the fight, if I'm totally honest. I mean, you look at the performance and you go out there and yeah, I thought Zhang would catch him. I thought that... I thought that Parker, and I'm glad that Parker won because I'm, I, I am a fan of Parker's. Me and too. I think you look at the resurgence of him, you know, going back the last 18 months. Look how much he fights. Fight. And, yeah, Three fights in 20 weeks. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you credit where credit's due. Yeah. But what he's done is I think Andy Lee's been a great addition and we've seen a change in him now, believing in himself a lot more as well. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. When you get that complete package, your trainer, and you've, you start feeling good about yourself, I mean, it, does, it, it, it helps massively. With, with the performances, and we saw that with Parker, I think. Got caught in the third round, and I thought, I was right. There you go, he goes over, straight left hand through the middle, and you thought, this is it. But what we found out with Zhang was that he didn't have that second gear. He's too big, mm -hmm. and he was there, and he was coming forward, and he, and he sort of blew a gasket, didn't yeah. he, really, like by about the sixth round. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't go through the levels, and Parker done what he had to do, and he just peppered away, and, it, and he got a deserved victory. But he just, I, mean, he looked... I mean, he went over, what was it, in the third and the eighth round, mm -hmm. and you're thinking, he showed a lot of balls in there mm -hmm. to do that, and that's what Joseph does. He, he bites down on his gum shield. He broke his nose, and, he? Yeah, and he showed a lot of balls in there, and you just go, you know what? He's established himself as an elite heavyweight, and he'll give anyone a go because, like you say, Simon, I think that we always knew he had bags of talent, and he had, you know, he's got every shot in the locker, 
but he never had the confidence in his, in his ability to step in with the shots. He played it a little bit too safe, a little bit one paced. Now he's he's, yep. he's going for it. Those last couple of before. I mean, to be fair, he went for it against, him to, to be level. fair, he went for it against Joe Joyce. He did. Yeah, he, he threw did. the kitchen sink at Joe Joyce. But he, was, he, he also told me after that fight, yeah, he was unwell. He was it. unwell, but mm. he didn't want to start going on about it because he knows the black back that she'll get, and that sort of makes sense when you look at the performance yeah. there and how he's yeah. come on. I mean, ultimately, I mean, I, I think it's another hell mary for the for, for for boxing in terms of um, the heavyweight boxing, but not for the same reason that Anthony Joshua's for all the other fighters that potentially didn't want to fight Zhang don't necessarily have to fight him anymore because he may not well be on the Trust front. Trust me, yeah. he's, he's avoided done, heavyweight. Parker's done everyone a solid there. Absolutely. Uh, he's, he's saved a lot of heavyweights, trust me. That's my point. Yeah. But is it an unfortunate set of circumstances for Joseph Parker that because of the position that Zhili Zhang occupied, which was taking over Joe Joyce's mandatory position yeah. for WBO, that Joseph Parker's been put into a situation where he's got to have a rematch... Yeah. With Zhili Zhang, with, mm-hmm. there's nothing really for Joe to gain from that, is well, there? No, Besides the fact, it, contractually, it, to get the fight in the first place, he had to sign to it. Yeah. But he's done his job. He's beaten Zhang. Absolutely. I mean, and it was one of those fights where you go, it's always going to be a dangerous fight. Zhang proved that he's got that power. He hasn't even got a lot. He's only got to be a half-hearted yeah. shot, and he'll take his mm-hmm. opponent down or take his opponent out. So. You do feel sorry for, for Joseph Parker because you look at it and you go, Deontay Wilder, now he's beating the guy that no one yeah. wants to fight, the chairman of the who needs, needs him, who him wants club, him yeah. club. And he's got to go over old ground again when, like you say, Simon, if the undisputed happens and the titles start becoming vacant, he could have got an opportunity there, but he's got to fight Zhang again, which is a dangerous fight. And But you just wonder, look, we, as we've talked about it many times, we don't know where this is going to land now. I've said there's a possibility of Anthony Joshua Parker too. That could happen. You know about rematches, the step aside money and whatnot. Mm. And so who knows how it's going to go. Yes, they've signed that fight. Does Parker want to go that over old ground again? Probably not. I know contractually he's got to do it, but the way the heavyweight division works right now, the Saudi radio investment, what fights they want, who knows? Mm. Who knows? What did you make of the atmosphere? I know you're not allowed to say it, but I've, you know, I mean, Frank, uh, Frank Warren got cross with everybody when he mentioned the atmosphere and suggested that people don't go to watch a fight because of atmosphere. I think that's absolute nonsense. Mm-hmm. People go to sporting events to see a good sporting event, but part of the sporting event is the atmosphere. The atmosphere and I, didn't, was, I think I the, atmosphere the atmosphere was better. I think the atmosphere was great. The roof came off when Anthony Joshua knocked out Francis Ngannou, yeah. but there were still times during the course of that evening. And I don't care. If yeah, but it like was it. better though. That, well, I did say it was a work in progress with, the, with and that's fair. what's going on. But you we also, because people got crossed the last time we criticised it, I didn't think the atmosphere was electric. And I think it, it, and there's reasons for it, which is culturally, and also it takes a period of time yeah. to build up uh, to build up an atmosphere inside events. The Saudis are new at it, so I, I accept that, yeah. and I don't have a problem with that. But I also does, doesn't mean that if you criticise something, if you want to be the boxing capital, then part and parcel of mm-hmm. it is to produce the same sort of atmospheres yeah. as you've got in places like this. And I will and I will also add that if you haven't got a bunch of Brits rolling around drunk and God knows whatever else, then some of the noise that we're well, they, used they, to hearing in boxing arenas won't be heard in Saudi. Absolutely. But I want to make that point because I get irritated that you're not allowed to criticise anything yeah. in Saudi because obviously everyone loves Saudi. Eddie loves Saudi. Yeah. Uh, Frank loves Saudi. Kala loves Saudi. Ben Shalom will love it because we're going to get paid for being there yeah. and it's going to be a huge opportunity but I do think it's important to get balance in the conversation with the atmosphere I think needs to get better absolutely listen we and we've said from day dot and this is where this is where the mistake has been made from their side and people not listening to the full conversation is that we said of course the atmosphere is not going to be what it is you know in the western world when we're here when you you know because it take alcohol out of the equation like you said you don't get the atmosphere because people get rowdy when they've had a drink you know and so and also with the you know the, the traveling aspect of things as well the, the costing of traveling etc you're not going to get the traveling fans or it's going to take a bit of time but what we are seeing is an improvement with the atmosphere that is for sure this atmosphere was much better than the one that we had in december no two ways about that you look at that one i was out the one in december see this one yes it was getting it is getting better and I think it is, it's a work in progress and it is going to improve. Yeah. You know, I think that we will start getting the travelling fans more and more, you know, as these fights happen. I think, uh, you know, the Undisputed is going to get a lot of people travelling there. I think you're going to get a better atmosphere again. Then we go again June the 1st and then we go again possibly July. What, Bibble I mean, versus... Um, Bibble versus Better Beer. Be- be- yeah. yeah, Better Beer, yeah. But then they've got the 5 versus 5 on that one as well. Mm. And I think that from what I'm hearing, there's a couple of fights I do know that are going on there that... I can't be talked about yet because it's not being announced, but I think they're getting announced this Saturday. 
But there's some great fights going on there, the five well, talk, versus five. Talking about the five great versus five, because there, there was a potential that Nick Ball was going to fight Ray Ford in that five versus five, yeah. wasn't there? Let's get on to Nick Ball, because I was, I don't know, we, we throw around these expressions, get a bit carried away of ourselves, but I did feel at the time that that was a despicable verdict yeah. in terms of Nick Ball's fight against Ray Vargas um, for, the February, for the WBC February, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, I thought Nick Ball won that fight. Yeah. I thought he won that moderately convincingly on the back of the second half of the fight. I think he struggled in the first six rounds. I think he probably won one of the first six, but I think he dominated the second half of the fight. I think he got two 10-8 rounds, despite yeah. the arguments that one some say that the first knockdown wasn't a knockdown. I think it was. The referee counted it. The referee counted round it. Round eight, the knockdown yeah. in round the eight. He, and it. if you look back at it, you look at the slow mo he landed left hook. It's not his fault Var uh, it's Vargas' yeah. feet are, uh, are not in position. That's Vargas' fault. The, the shot was landed. It was a knockdown. Round 11 again, Vargas totally come, come, like, come, come to apart. pieces. Yeah. He looked very fragile, went over again. And, and he might have nicked the last round, Vargas. But like I'm with you, Simon. I think that if you look at it, there's an argument there. Where you can go, Vargas won six rounds and Nick Ball won six rounds. But with the two knockdowns, makes it a clear, decisive Some victory. Scoring. I mean, I mean, they give it 116. One of the judges gave it 116, 110 yeah, what's to it Nick, with? which was a bit... Yeah, what's, what's yeah. he looking at? Yeah. What's he looking at? And I know the other two were close. I think yeah. one had it 113, 113. One had it 114, 114 112. Was it 114, 113? Yeah, yeah, Whatever, like that, yeah. but the decision should have gone... Listen, the draw's the draw, but the decision should have gone to Nick Ball with the two knockdowns. I think... See, I think he did. I saw it six rounds apiece, but the two knockdowns. Yeah. So I go 115, 113 in favour of Nick yeah. Ball. He should have won the fight. See, I, I, I saw the first six rounds being five to one. I'm and with I, you. Yeah. And I saw the second six rounds being five to yeah. one because I think, I think there's a case for Vargas for the ninth or the, the tenth. Yeah. Ninth for the tenth. That I think all the judges scored it. Uh, yeah. that, that he won that round 10 9. Yeah. And I think you know, if they all score it that way, then you've got to have some sort of degree of yeah. thinking behind it. But I think the two knockdowns for Nick Ball. Were Make the it a clear victory, yeah, absolutely. And I think that with that performance, because let's not let's not look at this, you know, let's not forget that the the, the first of all, you've got a very experienced two-time mm. world champion in Vargas, and the difference in physicality. I mean, there's a foot and a half difference between the two of them. Wasn't Mate, there? after like four or five rounds, I thought, I, I don't know how good Ray Vargas is, and he's a very experienced guy. And you're looking at him, and after four or five rounds, I go, Nick Ball, he can't close the gap. Mm. But he did. He was throwing his hands, and he is like what he says, the wrecking ball. Yeah. He's throwing his hands, but he weren't moving his feet into range first. And you thought, Vargas is going to be able to deal with this all night because he's got that experience and he can tough it out and whatnot. But when you got into that second half of the fight, we hit round seven, Vargas just started coming to pieces. And I thought, is he going to pull himself back together? But he didn't. And that was through Nick Ball's persistent pressure. Relentless. For doing it. Relentless. 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 And relentless. Off the back of that, though, you know, that second half of the fight with the knockdowns as well, I feel sorry for Nick Ball. So I, I really hope he gets so I hope I, he gets a rematch because he wins a rematch, by the way, by KO. I, I look at this and go, I mean, some of the, I have to say, I don't quite know what they were talking about in terms of going to Nick Ball's backyard. I mean, th did you hear that from Vargas? Yeah. He said, uh, and his trainer said, shows you the courage that we have to come to his backyard. Mm. Well, his backyard's in Liverpool, not Bleeding Riyadh. Yeah, I think, what, I think what they, I think what he was referring to is obviously Frank Warren and, and oh. he... he no, but that's what he was referring. I think that's what he was referring to. That Frank Warren is obviously the promoter out there, and Nick Ball box for Frank Warren. Silly, that's what. That, well, that's what. I, I, but I think it's a sad. I, I think that Nick Ball won a world so title. What he's trying to say is Nick Ball's the home fighter. Yeah, but he's because, not. It's a neutral space, and irrespective of the neutral space, fight, does, it make, does it really matter? Because of the promoter. Well, that's cobbler, isn't it? I think that's what you're going on about. But it's a silly, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, well, you're a world title sort of, holder. You're in a you're, you're in a fight where you probably you're got, cutting at straws a little bit. Yeah. Because if he was a home fighter, he would have won the fight. That's for sure. Because he did win the fight. Exactly. Yeah. I think that, um, I think it'll duck him. I don't think he will because I think money talks and I think that, I, I think that they will get Nick Ball to, that he deserves that rematch. I know man. he does, but in the featherweight division, it doesn't exactly make a lot of noise, featherweight, yeah. does it? So it, where's the, you know, when you had Carl Froch fighting George Groves or when you have a, another fight that needs to be called out, when you're fighting, you know, I mean, Jack Cattrall and Josh Taylor is, is a, you know, a division that has more attention than, say, featherweights, bantamweights, mm. all that sort of level of fighters that don't get the same level of attention that perhaps the bigger weight classes do. I hope he does. I think, I think Frank, Frank will get that rematch. Do you think Frank, so? Yeah, I, do, yeah. I really do. You know Frank, Fair enough. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, did hear Frank talk about that. Yeah, Frank will get uh, that rematch because he, he's very good at that, yeah. Frank, to, yeah. be, to be fair. And, and I know how annoyed well, hopefully he, he was will. with that. I mean, it'd be, uh, hopefully he will because ultimately I think Nick Ball comes away with a meaningless draw. Yeah. I mean, it's a meaningless draw because he won the world title. And Absolutely. I think that's... A, it's criminal. Yeah. It's criminal. And, it's, and the challenge for Nick also, just to make this point, is that he's travelled beneath the radar and his performances 
merit more press interest. Because if you look at, I think it's 11 of the last 14 fights mm. have all been stoppages. Yeah, Isaac Dogbar as well. Like, he's a good fighter. And that, that fight was a great fight as well. Like you say, he's not getting the recognition that he deserves. That created a little bit of a stir there, though, the Vargas one, because I think that upset a lot of people because it was, mm. for me, quite clear that yeah. he'd won the contest, didn't get his way. So I know Frank will get that rematch, I'm sure. Um, let's hope so, because he deserves it. Let's yeah. hope so. This time, um, justice is served out. Um, I sort of... I was on the toilet when I, uh, my phone popped up with the idea. I wish I'd stayed there. Uh, Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. Oh, God I read that. a brilliant article in the Mail um, written by Rafe about this mm. ridiculousness of this. Kevin McBride was the last person to fight Mike Tyson yeah. and effectively retired what was left of Mike Tyson. I grew up with Mike Tyson. I think, there's, did a, I. I think yeah. there's an argument to say that he's one of the greatest heavyweights that that ever lived. That three or four years space from 86 to 90. Burbick, when he, Spinks, yeah, Absolutely, come um, on. You know, Tony Tucker. Come on. You know, uh, you can go on, can't you, Briggs. Yeah. You can go on to a whole raft of the top fighters, yeah. Frank Bruno. He fought everyone that was yeah. out there. And that was a generation of fighters that I think were very significant. I looked at this, and I mean, I, I admire Jake Paul and his brother for making lots of money out of YouTube space, but a sideshow Bob for me, and I don't understand Do why what? Mike Tyson yeah. would want to be in this space. I think it's my reaction was this is ghastly. You don't you can respect Jake for what he's doing, what he's done, right? You know, and that's you know shouting all the noise, what he's doing, like helping a couple of boxers like Amanda Serrano, doing a great job for us. Yeah, and oh, that, great. That's and that space, about, do that. And that dance but about Roy Jones Jr. was don't, an exhibition. Yeah, but don't call out Canelo and say that you want to fight yeah. for the World Cruiserweight title. And then you go like this, you fast forward to this Mike Tyson fight and you go in there and you go, I think it's sad. Does he need a does, really does, does he need a dough? Well, why, why would you be doing it? Otherwise, I don't know, like, maybe I, it's I, I find it very, very does sad. Does he need a dough? It's one thing being offered some dough I don't think, and wanting it. It's another thing needing it. I don't it. think he does because he's got his cannabis plant, uh, ca cannabis yeah. farm where he yeah. earns a lot of money from that, apparently. I think he's sort of like, I think he's done a lot of dough yeah. and I think he's sort of got a lot back now. But I just don't know what, I mean, look, we've got to think about Mike Tyson's health, by the way. I mean, we've seen him on crutches. You've mm. seen him in wheelchairs. You know, you see that he does smoke quite a lot. He doesn't really live the life. And now you go, he's going in there and he's fighting. People will talk about little clips that they've seen on Instagram or on Twitter mm. of Tyson whacking the pads. You go, they're five, ten second clips. Mm. Like this guy, you got in there going in there. How sad would it be, by the way, if Jake Paul knocked out Mike Tyson? Which is a possibility, mm. if I'm totally honest, because of Tyson, where he's sat, his age, 57 years of age, health not particularly great, and you go, you've got this young kid going in there, and could you imagine if that happens? What it would do to Tyson, his legacy, and, and, and whatnot. I mean, it was a sad day when Kevin McBride knocked him out. Yeah. That was a really sad day. I would hate for that. So, yeah, I just think it's really sad. I understand I it because of the money side of things. I I understand the business side of it and the entertainment well, it's side. It's on Netflix, isn't it? And, 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 that's, it, and that's, they do unbelievable yeah, pay-per-views. Awesome. I get it. Yeah. I'm just, I totally understand it, but oh, that, uh, it, it would I be think, such a I shame. Think, I think it drags boxing and potential boxing people into a difficult space. Yeah. I think this idea that it's all about Disneyfication, it's commercial, it's business, it's television entertainment, I get it. But there, it's also eroding the parameters of boxing. I think the crossover argument with MMA question the validity of boxing. I think some of the people that are involved in boxing have questioned the validity of boxing and make the mainstream media look at it as like, ugh. Mm -hmm. And I think this, um, with Mike Tyson being dragged into a situation where irrespective of how clever these boys are, I, I, in terms of Jake Paul and being able to use YouTube and the influence of Marketplace, mm -hmm. I think it's crap. Yeah. I do. I mm -hmm. think his last fight, who was he fighting? Some Ryan Borland or someone yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. It, it's just crap. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and if we're talking about, let's have it right, if we're talking about Jake Paul's credibility for being a boxer is to lose to Tommy Fury, yeah. then this is, uh, I, I think yeah, it's... Yeah, well, that's uh, the only real guy that he's boxed, that is a boxer. Like you say, you go back Nate right. Diaz and the, you know... He's all a Love Island yeah, isn't he? Uh, yeah. <laughs> all the ex-MMA fighters that he's boxed and the retired fighters, you go like, now you're calling out a guy that's been retired mm. for, what, 25 Odd years or something. I guess, but if not that. He's a I boxing guess if legend. Let him stay. Let him keep that status. Or well, someone should be having a word in Mike Tyson. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, before we go, um, we were exchanging text messages um, on Friday about, or Saturday, whenever it was, about um, the potential fight that seems to be mooted. I don't know how real it is mm -hmm. between Chris Eubank Jr. Yeah. and Terence Crawford. Interestingly enough, I was watching some old footage of. 
Chris Eubank Jr. in the press conference he did with George Groves mm. before the Super Six series, yeah. where he was talking about the future that was going to be his and how he was going to dominate Super Middleweight, and he was pedestrian around and mm. didn't come up well against George Groves in that fight. Yeah. Um, can you see this fight? Can you see the reality and the reasons behind this fight? You've I got, can. You've got Crawford at 147. Yeah. Who's a unified champion. Stepping up two weight classes to 160 mm -hmm. to fight someone that's not even a champion. Yeah. Why? Because, because all roads don't end there. I know what he's doing here. Why don't he just fight Charlo? No, because Charlo hasn't boxed for how long? But he's still oh, so, Yeah, he's no, still... but there's mental health issues and all sorts going on with Charlo. What I'm saying is, he boxes Chris Eubank Jr., who's well ranked in, in all the governing bodies at, at middleweight. He moves up, so he's allowing his body just to adapt. Because you know what the end goal is, don't you? It's, it, it's Canelo. That's where he's going. You're going, Terence Crawford is going to box Canelo, but he's got to grow into the weight. Now, he's going to look at this opportunity and go, oh, there you go, 35-year-old guy. Looks like, you know, he's at that stage of twilight of his career. I can move up. He's well-ranked, so he'll go and nick He'll go and nick the WBO number one, number two, or wherever Chris Eubank is, WBA number one. He takes those. He goes and wins a world title at middleweight, then moves up to box Canelo. I think that is the journey for Terence Crawford, and that's the reasoning by, behind picking Chris Eubank Jr. I was told about that. I sent you that, didn't I? Mm. That, that, that I was told so that. So do you think it's real? Good. Oh, absolutely. You do? I, I believe that he's going for Eubank because Eubank is very well ranked in the middleweight. And what about And then Chris? He'll, he'll allow his body to adjust and build up to middleweight. Yeah. He'll win a world title at middleweight, which I believe he will. Then you've got to show that for Canelo. for Chris? Okay, we, yep. we, we just described what it means for Bud Crawford. Right? Yeah, we've now we've now most people have accepted or alighted upon the fact that yep. he probably is pound for pound the best fighter around there after what Absolutely. he did after what he did to um, El Spence. Yeah, right. Um, but what about Chris Eubank? Chris Eubank has told us repeatedly that he wants to win a world title and that he's going to win a world yep. title. He came back and he diminished Liam Smith after yep. losing the first fights. We've heard noises about Gennady Golovkin. Is Chris Eubank just chasing the commercial side of boxing rather than the reward side of it? Well, look, there was, I know it's price fighting. He, you was, guys w, he was WBO mandatory, were not he? That Yanabak was the champion. That fight was going to be made. And for some reason, unbeknown to Chris or, or, or the public, really, is that fight didn't materialise. They decided to go down a different route. I think Chris wanted to box for the, for the world title. That didn't happen through, I don't think it was down to Calisau and the promoters. Whatever the negotiations and the breakdowns were, I don't know if it was the numbers didn't stack up or what, but that fight didn't materialise. I understand where Chris is at. He's at that stage of his career. He goes, Terence Crawford, Chris Eubank, Chris has got the weight size on him. Crawford is, like you say, he's going to go down as a modern day great. And he'll, go, he'll look at that and go, I've got a 147 guy coming up to my weight. And I'm going to get a stack load mm. of money. I love some Come money. on, it's, it's, it, it makes sense. That's where Chris is at. Chris says, "Yes, please. I'll, I'll take this guy." While he's got an unbelievable reputation, it'll be and interesting, I get a stack load interesting of money. to see. As an aside, not to stir something up. At 160, not that his dad's involved anymore, but his dad doesn't want him fighting at 160, does he? No. So it'll be interesting to see what his dad says if he's going to fight Crawford at 160. How his dad reacts to it. Mm. Not that his dad determines it, but I just be yeah. interested to see what that reaction is because mm. we hear a lot of stuff coming on yeah. about Chris Eubank Sr.'s opinion of what Chris Eubank Jr. is doing. Look, I don't look, know. Do you, I, guess, I, I don't know, I don't know whether, whether I like it or I don't. Well, do you know what? I, I, I actually like the fight for those reasons because Terence Crawford is like, so you're, gonna, you're going, can he step up? Can he make that? This is going to be intriguing because Eubank can fight. He's a decent fighter and you go, you're going to find out more about Crawford at that weight. From Chris Eubank Jr.'s side of things, you understand, you go, if he was going to box Yannabek for the world title, he's not going to get one-fifth of the money he's going to box But I assume Crawford. you've already made your mind up about the outcome. What, of the fight? Mm. No, I haven't made the mind well, up. Then what you make... You say, let no, me get no, this no, right. what I'm saying See, is... Let me get this right. No, 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 what is, I'm saying is... Let me get this right. Hang on. Commercially, what, 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 it makes sense for no, both hang guys. On, hang on, hang on. Let me get this right. Yeah, go on. Your argument is, is that he goes up to 160 because they're, yeah. building, to, they're building towards Canelo Evans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that yeah. by your logic... He no, no, has, no, no, I'm no, telling I, you... I'm telling you... No, no, by your logic... Let me finish. Okay. He cannot lose to Chris Eubank, otherwise he doesn't fight Canelo Evans. that's right. So you've made your mind up then. I've not made my mind up on anything. I'm just telling you the roadmap. I'm telling you how it lands. I'm not telling you who wins and how. I'm telling you Terence Crawford's side, where he's look, the end goal is, where he wants to be. You so, do you, in the so do you think that. he beats Chris Eubank Jr.? Not sure. At one five, at one sixty, mm. he's a great fighter. Can he grow into? Can he put on another mm. effectively stone mm. in weight moving up? It's an interesting one anyway, because it's such a big jump up. 
you know, he's great at that weight. You go, if he moves up to 154, of course, I fancy him against Charlo or any, mm. anyone like that. Of course I would. But jumping up to 160 is a big jump up. So, well, we'll see. it's interesting. It's, we'll that's see. why it's a good fight. We'll see. Right. From the uh, Rolnet twins. <laughs> that's episode 64 of Talk Boxing. <laughs> we'll see you next time we're out.